Welcome to Debate Night, everybody. My name is Charlie Kirk. Tonight's guest is a self-proclaimed democratic socialist, a philosophy professor at Georgia State University, Perimeter College, and an adjunct professor at Rutgers University. He's a columnist for the Jacobin Magazine and has written four books, including his most recent, Christopher Hitchens, What He Got Right, How He Went Wrong, and Why He Still Matters. In addition to all of that, he hosts the podcast, Give Them an Argument, which you can find on his Patreon, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. Please join me in welcoming Professor Ben Burgess to debate. Hey, everybody. Welcome to this episode of Debate Night. With us tonight is Ben, or Dr. Burgess, or Ben Burgess, however you want to say it. We're going to be debating, and we'll see where it leads us, uh, Democrat socialism versus conservative populism. Super thrilled uh, that Ben is here tonight to have this discussion. It'll start with some opening statements, and then we'll take it from there. The two minutes is yours, Dr. Right. Burgess. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mr. Kirk, and uh, thank you to Town Circle for setting this up. So I'm a democratic socialist because I don't think anybody deserves to have less power or dramatically worse life because of factors that are outside of their control. So that's the first part. That's the philosophical basis. Concretely, I think it's obscene that we have an economic system where workers at Amazon warehouses skip bathroom breaks because they're worried about falling behind in their quotas and their boss literally owns his own spaceship. Now, we can argue about what a fairer society would look like. I can contrast what I would see as utopia with what you would, and I'm always up for that kind of thing. I'm sure we'll get into some of it later. But what I'd really like to start out with is not so much that end point as the baby steps towards justice that we could take right now. Things like raising taxes on rich people to pay for social programs that would benefit the rest of us. Things like raising the minimum wage for the working poor. Things like making it easier for ordinary people to organize unions so they can have at least a little bit of a say at what happens in the workplaces where they spend half their waking lives. And I gotta say, what always confuses me about you, Charlie, is that I see you say that you're not like an old style kind of corporate Republican in the Reagan, Bush, William F. Buckley kind of mold. And certainly the politicians you seem to be most enthusiastic about, people like Donald Trump or J.D. Vance now, make a big deal saying they're, they're populists, they really wanna help like struggling people in the heartland. And if that's true, I don't really get why you don't support any of those things that I just mentioned. Well, very good, it's almost exactly two minutes. So uh, I'll, I'll respond. First of all, thank you for being here. And if we want to spend an extended period of time bashing Jeff Bezos, I'm all for that. I think it's actually gonna be really fun. Um, so let me just first kind of tell you what I believe and why we believe it. It's kind of framed as conservative populism. Put simply, we believe in the natural law. We believe, as the Declaration of Independence says, the laws of nature are nature's God. We believe in limitations on human beings, and we should believe there are limitations on power, both government power and, yes, of course, cor corporate power, as Barry Goldwater said in the 1960s. We also believe America is strongest when families are flourishing, when there's a strong moral center, when middle-class work is respected and appreciated. And the populist component to this is we need to be aware of what's happening around us, see when core institutions are failing, like the family, which has been failing over the last 60 years in America, which can be attributed to many different, different things. I would attribute it to the rise of an aggressive social welfare state and an overindulgence in neoliberalism, that we must be willing to do something about it when the family starts to disintegrate, when our nation starts to fall apart, when our borders remain wide open, and so we pair those two things together, conservative populism. And the kind of philo philosophical basis for a lot of this is the willingness to act with prudence and wisdom to try and fix things that matter, things that objectively matter. And I've been really looking forward to this discussion. I think, I hope it's more of a discussion than a debate because we will disagree on plenty. But when you talk about a untouchable oligarchy, I completely agree. I think that there is an untouchable oligarchy in this country, both corporate and governmental, scientific and technological, that is crushing the everyday common man. Where I think we're gonna disagree is that I think the end goal, the thing that we must strive to, 
is family formation, family protection, and that strong moral center. And conservative populism is a resurgence of focusing on these things and developing solutions to hope fix, hopefully fix it. All right. Well, I guess what I would say is when you talk about limited power, right? I get that. That makes sense to me. I think that absolutely, uh, you know, I think oftentimes actually people get the relationship between these things really wrong and they'll think, well, the more you think that human nature is good and cooperative, you know, the more you, know, you might think that a fairer society is possible and uh, the more you think that human nature is flawed and selfish and cruel, then the more you, know, you should think that, hey, we might as well just stick with free market capitalism. But I think the opposite is true. I think that the more you worry that given too much power over another, you know, one person over another, that person is going to treat the other the way that Walmart treats its employees, the way that Harvey Weinstein treated aspiring actresses. The more you're worried about that, the more you should want power to be distributed as evenly as at all possible. And that's really why I'm a democratic socialist, that I think whether you're talking about Russia under Stalin or Amazon under our mutual friend Jeff Bezos. Not a friend. Uh, then uh, then uh, any time you have one person having way too much power over another without democratic accountability, I think you're going to get really bad abuses. So I think that's helpful. Where I think we'll disagree, though, is the means of which we can represent individual people against oppressors or people that have power. This is why I tend to defend markets. And I want to be very clear. Mm. Markets are a tool, something we set up to hopefully help human beings. There are externalities. There are jerks and dirt bags like Jeff Bezos that tend to con the system, not pay taxes, not treat their workers. And one of the reasons why this has become an emphasis, I think, of conservatives is we're willing to use prudence in a non-dogmatic way and say, wait a second, if we're trying to conserve something that is eternal and beautiful and true, is it a good thing that this kind of, let's just use Bezos again, $200 billion of net worth, while the average American family is struggling to pay off student loan debt or financial debt. Where I think we're going to explore, I can't do this in the remaining 20 seconds I have though, is true decentralization must happen in a way that is consistent with both reining in the administrative state and reining in the technological and corporate power sources in our country. And the ultimate form of decentralization is the family. Strong families, strong households. All right. Uh, so I guess when you talk about the family, sure, absolutely. If people, you know, social institutions are making it harder to keep families together, that's a bad thing. I think that, um, I, you know, I would point to uh, the financial pressures that, you know, that people are often under as a huge source of problems within families as a huge reason for relationships and marriages uh, failing. And that's something that I think would be helped by doing things like changing labor laws to make it easier to organize unions so people would be getting better wages and have more job stability, less of what employers like to call you know, flexibility and everybody else calls precarity. And so that might be one place to, uh, to start exploring this is, I mean, Maybe, maybe you'll surprise me here, right? But I do not think we disagree. We agree on that. So, yeah, just, am I good to respond? Yeah, yeah okay, go for good. it. Okay, go no, good. I just wanted, didn't yeah, want no, to no. take any of your no, time. No, no, please. So I want to get into the union argument. I want to get into the minimum wage argument. I want to get into the health care argument. And I'm glad for you to, to say, and I really want to zero in on this, that family formation is a good thing because that is something that is debated amongst some Democrat socialist circles. And once we kind of get into the back and forth, I want to ask you about that, because certain activist organizations tend to disagree. Some activist organizations will call the family oppressive, patriarchal, where I believe the family is beautiful and the ultimate social bedrock institution. And every single statistic shows that when families are flourishing, divorce rates remain low, which they aren't currently, that crime goes down and literacy goes up and communities flourish. And I think one thing we can agree on and you said it a little bit differently than I would, I think it's wrong when corporations are making families choose between spending another 10 hours at some soulless job or spending a weekend with your kids. I think the priority should be through our public policy and our laws should always be toward the development of children and families getting stronger. 
Well, I think that I think that if you want to have a traditional family, absolutely, you should be able to do that. You talked about activist organizations. I think that uh, I would point to like you know the Working Families Party uh, in New York, for example, as a uh, as an activist organization that clearly has no problem with families. Of course, if you want to if you want to live some other way. That's great, true. I think in a pluralistic society, I think everybody should be able to strive for their vision of the good life, and everybody should be free to live in the way that they want to be free. And I think that this is one of the biggest problems. You know, when we talk about things like healthcare, oftentimes people on my side will emphasize the fact that life expectancy is higher in places like Canada and the UK where they have socialized healthcare and infant mortality. And you want to talk about families, you know, people's babies are less likely to die in places like Canada and the UK than in the United States. And mortality amenable to healthcare, which is a stats nerd way of saying that you're less likely to die from treatable diseases is lower in those places. And I think all those are true and important, but I don't think it's the most important thing because most of us are not on the verge of dying most of the time. Most of us are not worried that our babies are gonna die most of the time. The biggest way, I think, that not providing everybody with healthcare as a right affects the lives of most people is that it makes us less free because people are a lot less likely to leave jobs that they hate if they're worried about, will I still have health insurance? Will my family still have health insurance? People stay in those jobs and don't pursue their dreams all the time because of that. There are people, you know, I think people who are in good families and they want to keep them together, absolutely they should be able to do that. But there are also people who stay in bad or even abusive marriages because they cannot afford to lose their spousal health insurance. And so I think that I think that we get we're not only happier and we not only live longer, but I think we're also freer if we take care of those things. So that, that's an interesting point. And what you're articulating, as before we get into the back and forth here, yeah. um, is what Lyndon Baines Johnson would call freedom from necessity, mm -hmm. which is something I take exception with. I, I do not believe the state should play an interventionist role in saying that it is the role of government to say that you should be free from wants or necessity. I would argue that through a national, natural rights compact that you should be pr free to pursue virtue. Now, that's not to say you shouldn't have a social safety net, which far too often becomes a hammock at a social safety net. But I think the design of government and the state, which is really what we're debating mm. here, right? What is, the, what is the role of public policy should be supporting things that are objectively good for people, for children, for the nation, and for the country. And so I'm happy to go into the th kind of three categories that are common points of Democrat socialists next, health care, union membership, and kind of the development of unions and minimum wage laws because I would argue that some of your policy prescriptions do the opposite. They don't actually help working families. They actually raise prices and hurt job mobility. But I want to take a short break and then we'll go back and forth if that's okay. Sure. Everybody, we'll be right back. Let's do it. to be, except American Indians. Um, a lot of the soldiers were very um, aggressive, so the women did get raped. What we call huerte. Huerte means a, a place of suffering, dying, starvation, not, nothing good. Just like the Nazi concentration camps. I didn't realize how corrupt things were. I didn't realize what kind of environment we were living in. We had no running water, we had no um, Power. They de incentivize people from, you know, opportunity. That's why our suicide rate has climbed up astronomical rates. I moved from the poorest county in America, the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, to the richest area in the country, the Navajo Indian Reservation. There is no difference. The poorest and richest reservations in our nation suffer from identical problems. This is not anything new. This is an everyday occurrence in all tribal governments. So my life 
and my tale and my truth has been to fight socialism. And I'm hoping that I can wake up as many Navajos as I can to tell them that you can do this, yeah, even if I have to fight you to save you. And I think that's what I'm also projecting to my people. Even though they are so harsh on social media and they completely hammer at me, I tell them, I'll be here even if I have to fight you to save you. What if I told you that this has all happened before? The riots, the violence, church burning, attacks on police, destruction of private property. My name is Sammy Steigman. I am a Holocaust survivor. This is the reality of what happens when you have capitalism that goes to socialism. El socialismo no funciona. El socialismo no funciona. Welcome back, everybody. All right, no more rules. We can interrupt each other. It's totally voluntary, unlike socialism. I'm kidding. That's my first <laughs> socialist joke tonight. So let me ask, so I want to ask you just kind of generally about Democrat socialism. Sure, yeah, let's do it. Um, where would you point to as one, two, or three examples that you think are the best embodiment of the worldview that you hold? Yeah, so I think that, the, that all of the things that I want, you know, I do not think exist together right now in the world. But if you want to talk about places where a lot of the policy goals that I'd support you know, have, have been implemented, I certainly don't think they're fully socialist societies by any stretch of the imagination. But I think a lot of it has been implemented. I would talk about you know, the places you'd expect me to talk about, your Sweden's, your Finland's, your Denmark's, your Norway's. Now, these are complicated societies that you know, there are right-wing parties win elections sometimes, too, and they do things that I don't like. But I think that these are places, broadly speaking, where a lot has been done to take certain things, like healthcare, for example, outside of the market so that people have that kind of freedom that I'm talking about, that they're not, that they're not tied to jobs that they hate uh, because they're worried that, uh, that they and their families' basic needs aren't going to be taken care of if they don't stay in that subservient relationship. And yet you talked earlier about how you want the state to support things that are objectively good. Yes. It seems to me that living longer is objectively good. Yes. Having lower infant mortality is objectively good. And I would also say that having greater freedom to live your life how you want and not being tied to a particular job, I think that's also objectively so good. So job mobility is interesting. I want to get into that. So I'm not stunned you mentioned the Scandinavian countries. Sure, yeah. So Denmark doesn't have a minimum wage. Well, but you got to you got to do the other half of that. That they uh, that they don't have a minimum wage, but they have vastly more favorable terrain for unions than the United States does, and so a lot of the wage floor is enforced that way. It's still not just they get whatever the market says they get. You but, know, but no government mandated minimum wage. What I find interesting, and there are some aspects of the Scandinavian countries appeal to me. Sure. According to the World Economic Freedom Index. Every country outside of Norway is more economically free than the United States. And so is that something that would interest you? Is e if economic well, freedom is the definition of your view, then well, I, I think, would change I think, I think the Bernie Sanders I, shirt. I think that what I mean by economic freedom and what they mean by economic freedom are going to be very different. I think oftentimes if you look at the methodology of those lists, it's very unclear. Like you'll get like the Cato Institute or whoever in some cases will do these lists where they rank places by freedom. And it's like, um, you know, the, the, things that, the things that they get points for, the things they don't get, don't get points for, abortion doesn't matter, whether you can have raw milk matters, you know, I think are at least unclear to me. But I, so, think, I, think, I think this is the bigger philosophical thing, sure. though, right? Like, let's, let's just do this rather than get into the nitty gritty about the list. 
I think that what those guys mean by economic freedom is how much business owners are free to conduct their business however they want, you know, without interference by the state. What I would mean by freedom in an economic context is the right of ordinary people to live the kinds of lives that they want to live and not be under the thumb to the extent that people are in the United States of whatever some corporation you know, uh, wants, them to, wants to make them do. Right, and so just to clarify sure. this though, about some of the Scandinavian countries, yeah. th they went through massive deregulation in the 1980s, right? Many of these Scandinavian countries did, including Denmark. Denmark has actually come out and has said, stop calling us socialist. We are not socialist. You've seen that quote. Well, I have seen it, but here's uh, okay, what but, 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 but I, I would like I would like to see, say Please something do. about this. Uh, and people could check out. I actually wrote something about this last summer for uh, Art Digital Media. I think I read it. Okay, well, there you go. So, so I, know, I know where you're going before you say this. All right, well, beautiful. But the audience doesn't know, so please Happily, tell though, them. there yeah. are people who are watching who don't know, so yes. let's, let's say it anyway. Uh, so I think that I think that saying that there's uh, that hey there here is this uh, center right kind of uh, prime minister who says no 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 these social gains have nothing to do with socialism, and you say oh well he says it right so so therefore he must be speaking for you know Denmark as a whole the Danish hive mind I think is approximately equivalent to if the only two you know if you were from Denmark and the only two Americans you'd ever talk to were Bernie Sanders and me and you said well here's what they say about what America's all about. Here's what they say about, you know, social security or yes. the post office. This is the American point of view. I think, you know, if you look at how long socialist parties were in power in Denmark and how many of those programs came about under them, I would not say that these are societies that have achieved socialism. We can certainly talk about what I would, what that would mean to me, but I would say that these are societies where socialist parties allied with strong unions have brought about really beneficial social reforms as an effort to move farther in that direction. So l let's talk about Norway, a sure, country that yeah. I'm familiar with, you're familiar with. Um, very wealthy country. Yeah. Why? Uh, because, uh, you know, I think, the biggest, I think the biggest reason is that they have done something that I'm sure that you wouldn't support, which is nationalize their oil you industry. You mean use fossil fuels, not keep it in the ground like Bernie Sanders would be. Bernie Sanders has tweeted, we need to keep all fossil fuels in the ground, but Norway's built a trillion dollar sovereign wealth fund after. That's okay, so, uh, so, so would you support that? Nationalization? No, but it's better than keeping it in the ground. Okay, sure. I mean, look, I think ultimately we probably are better off you know, transitioning to other energy sources, but, uh, but if we're gonna use oil, I would much rather that that oil be in the hands of the people, that it fund generous social programs like in Norway. And I often do kind of get a sense when conservatives say this, it's like, oh, well, there's really nothing socialist about it. They've just nationalized the oil industry and used the proceeds to fund all of these social programs. Well, I mean, if that's not socialist, can we at least have that not socialist thing? That sounds nice to me. Let me clarify is that if there is wealth to be redistributed, there must be wealth to be redistributed. Sure. And yeah. Norway has the advantage of having some of the most strategic oil reserves in the country. And I just pinpoint it in particular because there tends to be this anti-fossil fuel development uh, movement. I mean, it's, it's something Norway and, us, and the United States have in common is that we have a lot of oil. Now, if you want to, again, I know you've said you don't, don't want to do this. No, of course, if, I, I think the private ownership of minerals is a strategic advantage for the United States. But let me ask you about what I sure. think is one of the reasons why I think the Scandinavian country's pursuit of egalitarianism mm. looks good on paper. Okay, let's do and it. And this is strict immigration. Now, this has changed in recent years because of a lot of the Syrian refugee crisis and more kind of left-wing governments taking over Sweden in particular. But Norway, for example, takes in about 70 immigrants a day, even with their more relaxed policies. America, much bigger country, albeit, 2,740 legal immigrants, about 5,000 if, if you include the people going across the southern border. Do you, as being a Democrat socialist, do you support closed borders and strict immigration? No, I don't, and I'll tell you why. So, uh, two reasons. One is that I think that, you know, all of the economic data that I've seen says that having more immigrants actually increases the amount of wealth that society has, uh, has to go around. And the second is I would ask what the alternatives are, right? So, you know, we can do, you know, like those, those families that, you know, that you talk about, right? You know, we can, uh, you know, we can do things like separating, you know, separating families. We can do things like raiding, you know, churches, you know, to uh, to to drag out uh, immigrants. But I think 
we would really, really, really have to step up that like by like a factor of 100 to actually get rid of all the undocumented immigrants in the country. Whereas I think a much better solution, if what you're worried about is, hey, here are people coming in who, yeah, they, they definitely you know, contribute to economic growth, but here are people coming in who are willing to work for low wages or whatever. I think yes. a much better solution to that problem is for those people to have a pathway to citizenship so that they're not afraid to do things like join unions or they're not afraid to do things like, you know, take, uh, take their employers to court when they violate labor laws. I think that's a much better solution to that problem than the sort of heavy handed, you know, police, you know, police state kinds of tactics, which I think would be the only way that you're actually going to resolve the status quo in the other direction. One of the things I like about Norway that you just mm -hmm. said you don't like is to become a Norwegian citizen, you must speak the native language, mm -hmm. it's a non-negotiable. You must have citizenship by birth, it's not applicable. And you must have lived in Norway for at least eight out of the past 11 years. Mm -hmm. And so maybe you can help clarify this for sure. me, because the mascot you're wearing on your shirt sure. has changed on this, where because I would, I would understand the position you're espousing more mm. if you said, hey, we're going to close off the borders, we're going to take care of our fellow countrymen, we are going to reject these globalist institutions, because Bernie Sanders used to say that. In 2013, Bernie Sanders said, it does not make sense to me to bring hundreds of thousands of those workers into this country mm. to work for minimum wage and compete with American kids. Bernie Sanders said in 2007, six years prior, if poverty is increasing and if wages are going down, I don't know why we need millions of people to be coming into this country as guest workers. What changed? Well, I think that the main thing that changed is that the context of both of those quotes that you just read was not about whether there should be a pathway to citizenship. It was about exactly the opposite. It was about the Bush administration's interest in 2007 and then later revivals of it in 2013 yes. attempts to create a guest worker program, which I think he rightly compared to legalized slavery. A lot of immigrant rights groups were actually against those proposals for the same reasons, because those are things that instead of giving people the rights of Americans so that they aren't afraid to do things like organize unions, those are things that would essentially just legalize the status quo. That This is a second tier of workers who are not going to have those citizenship rights, who it's much easier to, you know, it's easy to, who can, you can kick out of the country if their employer decides they don't like them anymore. And I think that that is a completely different thing. I think it could also, so I think in that case, I think there's less of a contradiction there than you think. But hey, look, Bernie Sanders isn't on my shirt because I think, that uh, I think that the man is infallible. I could rattle off a list of things that he's gotten wrong over the years, but the reason he is, is that I think he's been the most important champion of doing things like raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour, like getting out, giving everybody health care, you know, ending the wars, et cetera, that would actually really materially benefit the majority of the population. And I guess I really struggle when I hear, you know, conservatives being interested in the welfare of the working class suddenly when it's this issue of yes. competition from low wage workers, which is a question of pitting some workers over other workers, but when it's a question of doing things that would benefit workers in general, like raising the minimum wage, like giving everybody health care, then suddenly it seems to be a different story. Suddenly it seems to be that this is too interventionist, this is too well, administrative look, state. So, so I mean, kicking immigrants out seems like a big expansion of state power to me too. Well, I want a small yet strong government. Strong in what it does, and foreign citizens, people, not foreign citizens, sure, mm. or illegals in the country should be deported, should be taken out. And I think there's a cultural aspect to it. It's deep down you agree with, and that's what Norway gets right. They realize if you don't speak the language, you don't have a, a shared culture, then there's something that all of a sudden makes it less like a nation and more like a colony or more like a temporary place for corporations to make money. Let's talk about the minimum wage. Sure. So the reason why I don't want abrupt, quick, let's say increases the minimum wage is it actually hurts workers. Washington Post, a very credible new study on Seattle's $15 minimum wage says the following. Workers have, workers have seen cut payrolls, put, they've been put off hiring, reducing hours, or letting their workers go. That is Seattle. Another study from just Target, just because Target raised mm. their wages abruptly in 2019, shows that workers say their hours were cut, leaving them struggling. Another one, okay, so, so, so I can go through them. So, I, have, so, well, I have a whole well, packet well, let's, of them. Let's, let's pause and do the first Seattle, couple. Seattle, the same thing. First couple, I go through New York. First couple first, because in Seattle, there have been a bunch of different studies, including one from, uh, from, from UC Berkeley, I know, 
uh, that have, I don't know which one was published by Jeff Bezos' newspaper that you're referring to there. Trust but, me, I'm uh, no fan of the Washington but Post. The, but uh, but there, was, uh, there was another study from UC Berkeley saying that actually it had no effect on, on the employment rate in the restaurant industry and it achieved its goals. I know if you look at the Congressional Budget Office, which oftentimes people with your position love to cite, uh, they said that if you raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour, and by the way, I thought it was interesting that you said abrupt, because I'm, I'm interested yes. in how, whether you'd be okay with it if you did it slowly. I, but, I, I think moderately kept up with inflation, done prudently, especially as we're about to have a period but, but of just, but, but mass should, inflation. I think that it that coupled with a worker's tax cut and other pro-growth policies wouldn't be the worst thing for the economy, okay. no. I think that's a moderate economic I mean, position. But keeping up with inflation, right, you know, like you're still saying the purchasing power of low wage workers should be what it is now. And I would say that if you want to run this argument that, well, it's actually going to hurt, you know, that's actually going to hurt workers more than help well, them. The studies show that, well, that it has. I don't think the studies do show that. Well, so here's what it says. So, so, low so, wage so here's, workers. Here's, here's why. You here's, I mean, like, I understand what you're saying, that the studies, the studies show, some of the studies show that minimum wage increases lead to increased unemployment. That's the big claim that's usually made. Sometimes people will also say that you know leads to a reduction in hours, but the big one is usually increased unemployment. And so I'd, so I'd say two things about this. First of all, the effect of minimum wage increases on employment is like the most studied thing in empirical economics in the last several decades. And there are studies you can find that say yes. There are a lot of studies that you can find that say no. And a, and a, a word I almost never hear from people who say that it's going to lead to unemployment increases is meta-study, right? In other words, if you look at a bunch of studies over time and see, like, you know, since you could have, you know, very small sample sizes and, you know, and making big conclusions from very small sample sizes is generally, and then, like, making a big deal about them in the press, that's how people end up believing that plants can think and coffee cures cancer, you know, that they looked at, like, some study with some super small sample size. But when you do the meta-study of a bunch of different studies, most of those show no. But let's say for the sake of argument, yes. Let's say that it does lead to some unemployment increase. Because you agree certain studies do show that. Yes, yeah, certain studies do show that. I think, I think most of them, and especially meta-studies over time, say no, but sure, let's say yes. So if yes... Would that mean that it was going to hurt workers more than help them? Well, we could look at like the Congressional Budget Office, what they said in uh, 2019, which was that um, two-thirds confidence that you'd have a range of unemployment effects somewhere in between zero and 3.7 million, and most likely they said 1.3 million people would lose their jobs. Now that's bad. I don't want 1.3 million people to lose that's their jobs. That's a lot of jobs. But they also said that 27 million people would keep the jobs that they have right now and, and be paid more and, uh, and would have more purchasing power. And so we say, okay, we have 27 million people who are being lifted out of poverty by this. We have 1.3 million people out of jobs. Now, even if there was nothing that you could do about that, I'd still say that treating this as a knockdown, well, this is gonna help poor people, working poor people more than it's hurt them, more than it's gonna help them, I don't think makes sense, but also, I don't think we have to accept that those 1.3 million people, if that's the true estimate, have to be permanently out of a job. We could have public works programs that could employ those 1.3 million people, give them let, dignified, let, let me, let me unionized public, public sector jobs. And if you don't think that there's plenty of work for those 1.3 million people to do in terms of federal public works, trust me, I could give you a long list of things so they could be doing. Let, let me build out the study, and then I want to ask you a question. Sure. So low-wage workers, on average, now clock 9% fewer hours, earn $125 less each month. That's Seattle. There's another one. New York City businesses struggle to keep up after a minimum wage increase. Would you support eliminating the FICA contribution for workers? Seven, that's a 7% tax on wages before we even talked about raising the minimum wage. Well, I'd like to talk about raising the minimum wage with no preconditions. But, 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 uh, wh but wh I'll... Why not the workers' tax cut? That's what I always don't understand, because we tax workers at 7%. 7% mm -hmm. of our workers here lose their paycheck as half of their FICA contribution. I never hear that from workers' rights advocates. Why? Well, I think that, I think that first of all, the first question you'd have to ask is, what's the money that's going to be generated by that for those workers? Then the second question that you want to ask is, what's going to be lost on the other end in terms of services if that's cut? And I think that 
paying people a higher minimum wage, having those 27 million people get a living well, wage. I can give them a 7%. And, I can give them a 7% wage increase tomorrow. And what? It's called cutting the FICA tax. Yeah. Every working person deserves 7% of their wages that are currently being taken by them by the government. Why don't you instantaneously so, agree? So what, so what are you going to, well, because I know what the other what the other shoe is that's going to drop there. What are you going to cut to uh, to uh, pay for that uh, that tax okay, decrease? Okay, so there's there's plenty. I could name a whole litany of departments. I think I would cut to try to pay for it. But let's pretend that it's paid for, like what everything in Washington D.C. says. Yes, Wouldn't if, it be if worth you it? if you could if you could cut workers' wages and not well, workers' wages. The, sorry, the taxes. sorry, workers. The taxes on workers' wages. If you could cut that. And on the other end, there would be absolutely no loss in anything that's a beneficial thing that's going to make workers' lives better. Then sure, why not? But I think I'm that glad you should still. Agree. I Good. think you should still raise. I think you should still raise the minimum wage because I think again, having those 27 million people now having a living wage, having the ripple effects for lots of people who are already making more than the minimum wage, that's going to increase their wages, and then. 1.3 million people need new jobs. Trust me, we can take care so, of that. So you're obviously no fan of President Trump or his administration. During his presidency, the bottom 10% of workers actually had an income grow faster than the top 10% of workers. And so what we saw was a real blue collar boom over well, I in mean, the I, prior I think, administration. I, think, I mean, I think what was Without having to abruptly raise the minimum wage. And the reason was, let me just finish, is an emphasis on entrepreneurship is this is an indicator that I don't hear talked about a lot, which is how many new businesses are being started. And when you raise the minimum wage, it's harder for the, the deli owner, the dry cleaner, to enter into the market because all of a sudden the labor pool is like, man, $15 an hour? I could barely pay to keep the lights on. So if we want new business, and you agree, entrepreneurship is a good thing, right? I think it's I think it's good to have new businesses. I'd like more of them to be organized as worker cooperatives. We're going to we talk can, about we unions can, in we a can, second. We can we can get into that. I, but I want to get but, deep but, into unions. But but, but but I but but I do just want to say on what you're claiming about the Trump economy because I think I think this is an important point, right? Why? So yes, sure. Why? What if? What? What explains those numbers that you just mentioned? You'd say it's a new emphasis in entrepreneurship. I'd say it's two Among, things. I, I could go through other things. Okay, too, but, but including but, but, an energy renaissance. But but I think I think I think the primary things are two things. One that quite a few states during that time period actually did raise their minimum wage, and I think that had a big effect on that. Two, sure, that employment increases uh, give workers more bargaining power, which a lot of conservatives now object to. They say, oh, nobody wants to work. But employment, uh, employment increases give workers more bargaining power in the labor market, and that's a good thing. But that's not really this new emphasis on entrepreneurship that Trump was doing. If you look at all the employment figures, um, whether you're looking at the overall civilian employment rate in the United States or whether you're breaking it down, black, white, Hispanic, whatever, all of those, you see the same trend, which is that in 2009, uh, you know, at the beginning of the Obama presidency, when the, when the effects of the 2008 crash were really coming in, all of those were way up here, you know, that, they, uh, that it was like, you know, you have like 10% unemployment. Uh, over the course of the, eight, uh, of the eight years of Obama, it goes from 10% to 4.7% overall civilian, you know, unemployment. And then sure, under the four years of Trump, or, you know, like, like we'll give him a pass for the COVID part, but they, uh, but like under, under those Thank years you. of Trump, then uh, <laughs> you, you go from 4.7 to 3.5. So that is a continuation at an overall slower rate, but a continuation of what had happened before. And the reason I'm bringing that up is not that I'm a big Obama guy. I mean, look. No, I know you're not. As you know, I'm a Bernie Sanders would be a good start guy, but and I want to get into that. Too, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because I, I think you are. But sure, well, we'll cleverly we'll, cloaking your okay, radicalism well, I, I don't, in three issues that are agreed I don't, on. We're gonna we're gonna get I don't, to the root I don't of that. think so. I think I front loaded the radicalism and said these would be baby steps in the right direction, and I'm very we're, confused I, I about guess how, how you could be a populist without we're supporting all, those baby steps. We're all Hegelians now, I suppose. Let me but, ask but, you this no, question. No, 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 no. But 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 I do want to I do want to finish the point because I think it's an important one, right? That the that it's not that I think Obama is great. It's that I think that if you're going to say the populist thing about you know Trump and you know Trump economics, even though uh, this is a guy who appointed hardcore union busters to the National Rela Labor Relations Board, this is a guy who tried to throw millions of people off of uh, off of health care, you know, in terms of going against the Medicaid expansion. This is a guy you know who tried to make it a lot harder to qualify for food aid for those families you talked about that the big populist thing is that he oversaw economic growth and hence job growth well hey if that's enough to be a populist 
Barack Obama was a better populist than he was, and Bill Clinton was a big populist because he oversaw lots of economic no, growth and, and, and in that's the not 1990s. What, what, what I am saying, though, is that it's mischaracterized that the people that you say you care about, the lower workers, actually did really well under those four years. I think Trump could have been more conservative, more populist in certain things. And just to clarify on the food, sure. on the food stamp issue, millions of people got off of food stamps under Trump voluntarily because their wages went up. But I, I don't want to yeah, get you, too bogged. Yeah, you, I really don't want to get too bogged down I mean, on the on the. Yeah, Trump you, you had thing. that extra but, one percentage change of uh, unemployment going down, which is a continuation of previous right. trends. But so, sure. so, so let me kind of ask you uh, uh, more broadly. I guess we could go into yeah, yeah. some of these other aspects. I have a of question this. I'd love to ask you in a minute, by the way, but go for yeah, it. Yeah, you're free yeah, to do yeah. that, too, sure, by the sure. way. Do you trust the government? Do I trust the government? Uh, do I trust the government... Um, to uh, to to tell me uh, to tell me the truth to uh, to do things uh, that no the government by and large uh, that I think that uh, those uh, millionaires and billionaires the guy in the shirt likes to talk about exert vastly too much influence but here's where I think people often go wrong from that too true premise that the government is untrustworthy I think premise is fine but the conclusion therefore we should have less government in the sense of we should have less expansive social services, uh, we shouldn't give everybody health care. I think that that's a fundamental confusion because I think that there's a difference between talking about what the government can do to you. And there we're talking about police, ICE, you know, uh, the, the expansion of the national security state. Yeah, and this what, is important. And, and what the government has a legal obligation to do for you in terms of supporting what I would see as fundamental so, human rights like health care and education. Let me tell you where I think there's a, a flaw in this, and I, I really want you to talk about this. You say health care and education. There must be bureaucrats to enforce these things. You need the administrative state. So then you get the CDC, you get the NIH, you get unregulated agencies that you as being someone who focuses on democracy, focuses on the power of the people, where is the check and balance against the CDC, the NIH, HHS? For every government program, you need hundreds of thousands of desk workers, which is where oh. the word bureaucrat comes from in French. So you say you don't trust the government, yet you support expanding the social services, which will then necessarily expand government. Why do you want to expand something you don't trust? Well, first of all, congratulations on the French vocabulary. I like it. But I have other words, too. We could <laughs> to operate no les deluge, which means after me the flood. We could talk about all my favorite French terms, if you'd like. Uh, we could do a whole thing. Are you write for the Jacobin magazine, for yeah. goodness sake, so we could exp you know, exchange notes on sure, Robespierre sure, and Jean-Jacques sure, Rousseau. Sure. I've only read the confessions once. Go ahead. Okay. Well, um, I'd be happy to do all of that. <laughs> uh, although, you know, my French is like Duolingo. I can't do that much. But, uh, uh, but, I, I'm done. But, I promise. But, but I would say that if you don't want bureaucrats to have more power, if that's the big objection. No, that, that, that's part well, of the well, objection. Okay, it's but, an but, element of it. Sure. So let's, let's start with that element. So if you don't want bureaucrats to have more power, then the thing that you should really object to, right, because you, you said earlier, you know, you think we've got to have some kind of social safety net. So we're agreeing that there are some social services programs. We're arguing about how expansive they should be and how they should work. So Generous so, versus limited. Sure. Okay. But this is the thing. If you want those bureaucrats to have less power, you don't want limited. That's the last thing that you want. You want generous. And here's why. Here's you're going to have to convince I, I, I me know, on this I one. know. I know. Like, I, I really liked what you just did there. The, uh, like, that was, that was some good... You know, the, uh, yeah. that's, uh, so, but, so, so to restrain their power, you must give them a lot of power. No, you're not giving them any power. You're taking away their power. It's a really simple argument. Here's how it goes. The, uh, that means tested programs give power to bureaucrats. When you say you have to jump through all these poops to qualify for something and there's some bureaucrat who gets to decide whether you get it so, or not, here's why bureaucrats have, have more power. Whereas when you say this is a legal right that every single person has as a citizen, no Canadian is having a bureaucrat decide whether they qualify for health care or in Finland. Uh, you talked about all of the policies that you know in Norway that you thought would be an issue for me. Finland is the poorest uh, where they have. Country. Uh, yeah. Okay, I don't think it's because of this, but they. Uh, but you know, in uh, in Finland, where uh, they don't even have uh, private schools, and certainly uh, you have a right to higher education uh, as a citizen, the way that you know the way that you know you have historically in lots of countries, and I think it's worked very well. But when you have that, you don't have 
you know, students jumping through financial aid, bureaucracy, you know, hurdles, and does this person qualify to get school? Does that person qualify to school? Where bureaucrats have the power to decide what's up, so, because that's the case where bureaucrats have power over you, and everybody gets something as a right of citizenship. Bureaucrats have no power but, in that circumstance. So, but let, let me ask you something, though. So you want Medicare for all. Yeah. Yet HHS is the largest civilian branch of our government. So as we have expanded Medicare, as we have expanded Medicaid, it hasn't been means tested as you want. We have hundreds of thousands of desk workers that are doing the means testing. Are you qualified? Yeah. Medicare reimbursements. And so even yes, under your example, well, it, but, it's, but, but, but it's, it's woefully idealistic. The point is, is Med you, Medicaid is a means you tested. cannot have a generous social program without a massive bureaucratic and, dare I say, corrupt administrative state. Well, I think Woodrow I, Wilson would even say that. Well, he says, you I mean, need the administrative you th you th state. You think I like Woodrow Wilson, the, uh, the guy who... Probably. The he guy, was a college professor, so... Okay, well, okay. And a college president, uh, so he's kind of in your world. Well, okay, trust me, neither of those things are in any points for me, but, uh, <laughs> okay. but I think that... Uh, That's fair. Uh, but, I mean, Woodrow Wilson is the guy who resegregated uh, the, uh, the, federal, uh, the federal bureaucracy oh, after it was trust me, I in integrated. Do he a whole put, speech on he put Eugene G.V. Debs in jail. Nobody on the left is going to see Woodrow Wilson as a hero. Liberals. Nobody on the left, but I was just going to say I, I know plenty of people that would, but that's fine. I don't. I don't how think. About, I, don't, I don't think you're going to find a lot FDR, of socialists. FDR, LBJ, who John but Dewey, they, all these people believed but, in a strong administrative. Well, state. I mean, you're rattling off a bunch of liberals, but that's okay. We don't. We don't need to argue about the historical figures. Let's just say this: if you're talking about administrative state bureaucracy, well, your example is Medicaid, which is a means-tested program. Uh, and even at that, even despite the means testing, which is the part that gives the bureaucrats their power, which is also the part I'm objecting to, even despite that, we're talking about bureaucracies. As I think you mentioned earlier, bureaucracy, the government has no monopoly on bureaucracies, plenty of bureaucracies in the private sector. And if you want to know which programs have the smallest overhead, right? Even Medicaid, even despite the means testing, Medicaid, Medicare, all of those have much smaller administrative overhead than any of the private insurance companies because the private insurance companies, one, they have to plan out their strategy for competing with each other, and two, the private insurance companies have a vast bureaucracy that is dedicated to finding ways to deny people's claims because they've always got one eye on the bottom line for shareholders. And one question I'm very curious Please, about, by, it's, by, it's by the turn. way, How is that? that they uh, is... Um, you know, you object for all of these reasons. You think it's too interventionist. You think it's too much administrative state to just providing everybody with health care. These are all elements of the with, critique. With, yeah. you know, providing people with health care is a human right so that you can have, like, what people I know in the UK always tell me, which is, hey, when I, you know, when whatever, my mom got cancer, when whatever the situation is, people will say, the only person I ever talked about this was, was with a doctor, which is very different from Americans' experience with healthcare. If you can object to that on the grounds that it's, that's too much big government, I am really curious whether you'd say the same thing for like uh, fire services, like, like would you be okay with it? if we didn't have public fire services? If... Absolutely not. As I said, small but strong. Okay. That the government exists, as it says in the preamble of the Constitution, amongst many other things, to secure the blessings yeah. of liberty, to ensure domestic tranquility. And Hamilton said it best, that you need a nimble yet effective federal government. Good at what it does, but not overreaching. And that's the whole idea of conservative populism is within this constitutional republic framework. I'm a big fan of firefighters, police officers, I'm a big fan of Border Patrol. I'm a big fan of all these sort of things. But when, when all of a sudden I believe you get outside of the constitutional limits is where you birth this fourth branch of government. And our mutual hatred of Woodrow Wilson is a perfect example of this because he really believed the state, this is a Hegelian idea, will usher in that utopia, that the state is God, that through the mechanisms of the state, we will be able to turn the chapter and with it remake man. He wasn't the only person that believed that. FDR did, Lyndon Baines Johnson did as well. Where we as conservatives and conservative populists say, hold on a second, that is not what the state is there to do for. Let me just say one last thing, which is that we, the state is there to preserve the natural law with yep. prudence and wisdom, to hopefully develop families and foster children, not to try to meet, remake human beings. When it comes to health care, not only do I have a moral 
complaint that it's not the role of government. It's also not good at doing it, well, and it also hurts the everyday okay, common I, man. I, I so I have two. I, 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 don't, I don't think either of those things are true. But, but I have but, a moral but, but, argument, but, but, and I also have utilitarian okay, well, arguments. I just want to make sure that's let's, clear. Let's start with the moral argument, because okay. I am very unclear on this, because why is it that having public firefighters or public police uh, is not overreach, but having public health care is? Why would it be objectionable if instead of having public fire services that everybody gets to use, you had everybody just having to have private fire insurance, and if you had a better private ins fire, fire insurance plan, they'd probably put out your fire you know, faster, or maybe we had public fire, fire insurance, but only for people, the poorest people or the oldest people, which would be the exact equivalent for healthcare, or the same thing for, uh, for, you know, for policing, the equivalent you know, for like security insurance, because all of these things seem very similar to me, because having your house burned down, being victimized by a crime, or needing chemotherapy. Those are all cases where your life and limb is in danger. Like these seem pretty parallel to me. What, what do you see as the big well, disanalogy? So, so the first, first problem is mostly local, police and fire, so therefore it's more accountable. Okay. So the dollars don't go to some sort of albatross to the kingdom of Washington, D.C. of unelected, unknown, kind of just unchecked bureaucrats. That's number one. Number two, we do have a system in the country, despite what you're saying, where if you need health care, you will be taken care of. Is it well, broken? Is it inadequate? Said, though, right? Well, hold on a second. It's already, I'm saying it is illegal to deny someone service of care. Illegal. Now, do we have problems with our health care system? Could, do you think if you could put me in a room and I could strike a huge bargain with you? I think that there are elements of the German system that are admirable. I will say that. Where you have a public system and a private system. Where I start to all of a sudden say, time out, no go, no fly zone, is where I he hear people like Bernie Sanders, and I'm paraphrasing, who want to get rid of private insurance as we know it. That's a big mistake. Healthcare, here's how I think the biggest problem with yeah. healthcare is. It's not individualized, it's way too, you know, way too bureaucratic, mm -hmm. way too top down, and yes, we have pharmaceutical companies that are addicting people to drugs that they should not be addicted to. We have a sick care problem in our country, and I agree with a lot of people on the left with this, on this, maybe we'll agree that we have an obesity problem, we have a problem of how we get our food, we have a corporate farming problem. I agree with all those things. Do I think that a government-run system of health care that will be more similar to how the IRS or how the Postal Service works, that's how, somehow going to be the solution to that? Absolutely not. Well, but I mean, if you the, put me the in a post, room... The Postal Service is amazing, and I do not Whoa. think... I do Can not you say think, that again? The Postal Service is amazing. It has been an engine of upward mobility. It has been right, an engine uh, of racial equality. If you are uh, building the black middle class, massively an engine of that. Have you ever it, used it is, the Postal it Service? It is. I have. And the Postal Service will carry a letter from here to Alaska. So FedEx. For, no, not for the same price, and they're certainly but not going to serve. You know it's going to get there. No, I do not know that, and it's certainly not going to do it. It's never going to get there with as much service to out-of-the-way rural areas. i got to give you credit. Anything. I've never anything heard anyone defend the post like office. A, like, like as cheap. Well, you need to talk to more people because, like, the post office is an amazing institution, and uh, it should be massively expanded. In fact, one of the best things I think they have in some of those Scandinavian countries is postal banking, which, if we did that, Bernie Sanders' proposal would immediately put out of, the, out of business all the payday, uh, you know, payday loan uh, vampires that, you know, prey on unbanked people would create millions of new good unionized jobs. Postal service is so, great, but I, I, I do want to go back because I don't want this. To get, I, 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 I got to I, I don't want this to get lost. The post lost, office though, lost hundreds of thousands of packages and was six months late. That's who you want to run our healthcare system. I think that. Well, I first of all, I think that uh, I think that if you actually have a fairer look at the numbers, I think the postal service does uh, does do a really good job. I think that oftentimes. When people say no, uh, they are not using the same metrics to evaluate it they'd use to evaluate everything else. But if you want to know something that would be very much like what Medicare for All would be like if we had it in the United States, then I'd say looking at delivery of packages is probably not what you want to do. What you probably want to look at is countries like Canada, where they already have Medicare for All, Great Britain, where they've gone further, and the, Let me tell you the, why that's the hospitals though. are publicly owned. That's that's all of a sudden. Let's and, talk about and, that. Well, okay, but those are places. That's a different where, thing. Where, where people where people live longer, where let fewer of their babies die, uh, where uh, the rate of mortality amenable to health care is way better. Or look, you said you want it to be local. Uh, you know that you don't like the fact super localized. That, sure, sure, local, great. So if uh, if all the hospitals were municipally owned, you'd be cool with that. 
all the hospitals, it would be, well, first of all, that happened, that's actually the case in a lot of places. There's a lot, it's county run hospitals all across the country. I'm not denying they're county they're run. Disaster, county, 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 actually. County, okay, so you would be okay with that. So it really has nothing to do with centralization. Well, no, it, it does, trust me. The city of Chicago can be equally, if not more corrupt than the kingdom of Washington, D.C. Is it, is, is, is it gonna be more corrupt than uh, the private insurance companies? Could, I mean, that's a good question. Okay, Let but, me ask but, you a but, question. But, but, you, but you did also say, right, and I really wanna make sure we do that, that local we, 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 we is do generally this, better, but it, this, I'm this, not this gonna does, die on the Cook County is a great this county does, hill. Well, this, this, does, this does go back to what you said earlier, though, when I asked you about fire protection, because you said, well, the, you know, the difference is that uh, nobody could be turned out from the hospital. Uh, Th yeah. That is a law. Yes, that, that, is, that, is, that is a law. I'm glad that it's a law. I, I, I am too. I, okay, good, wonderful. We, we agree on that. That is a good government intervention to stop the private sector from doing what it would otherwise do and did otherwise do before that law was passed. But um, also, I would say, do the equivalent for the fire services that the only people who, uh, who get it uh, without having to pay at the point of service are the poorest people, are the oldest people. Uh, everybody else has to rely on private fire insurance, which varies wildly in quality. And if you don't have private uh, fire insurance and you're not poor enough to qualify for the means tested bureaucrat enabling uh, system for poor people and you're not old enough for the other one and you end up having to have the fire department come and save you anyway, then you have a giant bill that's going to so bankrupt you. Do let me you ask think you that question. sounds like a fair system? No. So let me ask you a question. Yeah. So is that, here, here's where, how do you define healthcare? This is a very important question, mm. right? Because healthcare could be, hey, I just got a gunshot wound I need to be taken care of. Absolutely. Mm. Or, or healthcare could be, I'm 800 pounds overweight, I'm eating terribly, I have no sort of interest to exercise or eat well, why all of a sudden should that person be put into the same exact level of care of someone that has saved money and taken care of their health? Why should someone who's 800 pounds overweight be given in this sort of you know realm? Why should human agency and choice have zero emphasis at well, all? What you're, uh, what you're describing, the only difference between that and what already exists in the United States is that we would have to add and they're rich enough that they can afford really high quality medical care. Right now, somebody who's 800 pounds, who doesn't watch their diet, who chain smokes, et cetera. I agree, yes. But, you could add chain smoking But on sure, yeah, yeah, all, the, all those things, all those things. So you think that so, none no, no, of that no, should no, be given a preference? Well, what, here's what I'm saying, that I think in the system that we have right now, somebody who checks every single one of those boxes, but uh, is rich enough to afford the best medical care, skips in line ahead of the person who takes care of their health, exercises every day, doesn't smoke, eats well, but lost their job or just is, uh, is cobbling together four part-time jobs like so many Americans are and thus doesn't have employer so this health is an insurance. It's an interesting question. So you believe just because you have better money, you shouldn't be able to have better stuff? I believe- Or more money, better stuff. I believe that when it comes to something like healthcare, uh, no, that, that's I, a very broad thing. I don't. I do not believe that people should get life-saving services preferentially because of how much money they have. I think that so. How much money they've saved? If how about that? Have, Someone saved their whole life, and they said, "In case there's a disaster, I'm going to put five hundred dollars away a month." They get to age forty-five, and all of a sudden, they realize that they have some sort of health complication. They shouldn't be able to take advantage of the money they've saved for their entire life. Well, this actually goes back to the very first thing that I said. Like the uh, the opening the opening couple of sentences what is justice, that, that, I guess, I, that, right? I, that I said, because what I said is that I don't want some people to have dramatically worse lives than others because of factors outside of uh, their control. Now, what about if we, if they we, can if we, control though? Well, if we like li saving if money, we, if we lived in a world where all economic inequality was due to thrift versus indolence or laziness versus industriousness, I would have much less objection to this stuff that I do in the world where we actually live, where somebody who saved up their whole lives, but, uh, but then uh, they, have, uh, you know, they have unexpected uh, medical expenses that bankrupt them, which happens all the time, uh, that they have, uh, you know, is, is, is going to get worse health care than somebody who has never saved at all. But as somebody uh, like, you know, if somebody like, uh, if Hunter Biden, right, had some massive medical bill tomorrow. He would probably have, I mean, yeah, considering he would, he his would, lifestyle. Sure, sure, right? So if Hunter Biden had that huge medical bill tomorrow, 
then he would get in line ahead of people. For, for multiple reasons, both access to power and also money. Sure. So that's yeah. a good example. Those are, uh, those are both bad things, but they have- Largely a, unearned, and I agree. Sure, so and I would say the same thing about the Walton children. I would say the same thing about anybody uh, who is inheriting money. When you, go to, when you go to the hospital or you, know, or you go to buy insurance, they don't ask you, did this money come from so, being thrifty and saving your whole well, life? Let me ask you a question. Or, 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 or did this money come from stock ownership? This or did this, did this money come from inheritance? They just ask, do you have the money right. to afford and, and this? That, and that's part of markets, right? Is that you're not able to make a moral claim for every dollar bill, but generally markets will go towards value and value creation. We're up against the hour break, and we're gonna take a short short break, and then we're gonna resume, if that's okay with yeah, you. Absolutely. I got a lot more I wanna go to, but I actually wanna close this thought on one thing because it goes to your other thing that actually, you're very- actually, 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 could I, I mean, if you'll indulge me, could I, uh, could I, could I ask you like a 30 second question? Sure, because I got, I really want to close I, that I, point, I know, but, I know we're coming up to it, yes. but, I, but I'm so fascinated by this, sure. right? So we agreed Is earlier- Is it the firefighter thing again? It's not the firefighter. Okay, okay. Thing. Okay, uh, although, you know, I think there's more to discuss I'm there. I'm very anti-fire. <laughs> well, that's, that's good. Uh, you should be equally anti-cancer. And then just like, just like we have fire departments, we should have Medicare That's why for I all. think people who but eat well a, and don't smoke and make good decisions should be rewarded for human agency. Yeah, which is not at all what Because the inverse of your do. statement, but I just want to make sure this but, is clear. But, 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 the but, inverse is you say that people should not be penalized for factors outside of their control. The inverse is that I think people should be rewarded for factors inside of their control. Yeah, and most which of is what, a preference and most of what we've got right now action. is not about. No, I agree with that. But they have so a but, 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 that rewards people for good choices. Okay, so. Here's what I want to ask, real, real quick. Sure. I promise. So, uh, we established earlier how much we both liked Jeff Bezos. Yes. Uh, just like best Jeff. Are you going to ask me should I raise his taxes? Well, because this is why I'm curious about it. Because I because because I, I, I saw in 2019. Yes, with Kyle Kalinske. Yeah, and he asked you, would you be willing to raise Jeff Bezos's taxes by like one percent to provide housing for every single homeless veteran? And your response at that time was that you'd hope he'd do it voluntarily. And I think at this point we've established that's not going to happen. He prefer to buy a spaceship. So that's probably true. Uh, yeah. So if you put a gun to my head, would I would I raise his taxes? I mean, I guess if I was a representative, I guess yes. For okay, other, that's good. For this other is, reasons. This but, is progress. But, but I'm so let, proud of you. Let Charlie. me tell you. I said, I guess conditionally, if all of a sudden there would be a comparable piece of legislation alongside of it that would actually value and prioritize things I cared about. If it was just to raise his taxes, to go into the curb, current albatross okay, but, pit but, but, of the but, but, administrative but if, state, I'd rather have him buy spaceships than give money to Fauci. But, but, if, but if it was earmarked for a housing for homeless veterans and you would say yes The now, answer is yes, because I think Jeff Bezos, this is, from, from a this moral standpoint- This is such good progress. But let me tell you why, let me clarify why. Sure. Jeff Bezos games your favorite department, the Postal Service. He games the corporate tax loophole system. Yeah. Jeff Bezos has a total disregard for what I consider to be the American way of life. And he has this weird fascination of going into orbit. And guess what? I hope he stays there. Okay. Well, I congratulate you on this progress. <laughs> well, I mean, you could call it progress. You could also call it a commitment to prudence. Okay. Which no, is, no. But it, it's that Greek it's word new, prudentia, it's a found, which is it's looking a at things as they are. Prudence. And it's a non-dogmatic way of governing yourself in the country, which is a perfect segue to the question I wanted to ask, because we're going to take a short break. We'll be back here with Dr. Burgess. If we're agreeing too much, don't worry. We'll get back to the disagreement first. I'd like to thank Professor Burgess for joining me tonight, as well as Town Circle, who partnered with Turning Point USA to bring you this conversation. I hope you all enjoyed the debate and encourage you to engage with those who do not share your views. If you'd like to learn more about Professor Burgess, check out his books and don't miss his podcast, Give Them an Argument. You can hear the rest of this debate on the Charlie Kirk Show podcast, as well as the Town Circle website. That's Town Circle with an S towncircle.com or check out charliekirk.com for the debate on our podcast feed. Debate night. We'll be back soon. God bless you guys.